Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today with the Lexington County Public Library System's virtual author talk series. Uh, I hope you uh, really enjoy this talk that we're going to have today with Tom Poland and, and Rob Simbeck. First, I'd like to talk about our co-host, Tom Poland. You've probably seen his face before. We've had him many times. He's a great author, and, and we really enjoy having him. And I'd just like to say I, it's been a blast listening to Tom and Rob talk uh, for the last half hour <laughs> when we were getting ready for this. I think they're two kindred spirits, but Tom's work has appeared in a, a lot of magazines throughout the South. We, we most recently had him talk about his new book, The Carolina Bays, Wild, Mysterious, and Majestic Landforms. Uh, that's available through USC Press as well if you go to their website or wherever you buy books. Um, but I encourage you to check that book out. And we also have a video of Tom talking about that book as well. Um, yeah, so let me talk a little bit about the Southern Wildlife Watcher. That's Rob's book um, that we're here to talk about today. It's a colorful look at 36 common and not so common animals that are found in the southeastern United States from the hummingbird to the bald eagle and from the bullfrog to the bobcat. Uh, Simbeck is one of the southeast's most widely read naturalists. He combines a poet's voice with a journalist's rigor and offering readers an intimate introduction to the creatures around us. A foreword is provided by Jim Casada, the author or editor of more than 40 books and some 5,000 magazine articles. Uh, Simbeck has written for the Washington Post, Guidepost, Field and Stream, Birders World, Wild, Wild Bird and Wildlife Conservation magazines in 20 states. <laughs> He's the author, ghostwriter, or editor of more than 20 books, and he's a former president and chairman of the Southeastern Outdoor Press Association. And his book is available as well wherever you purchase books, either online or your local bookstore, uh, but also through the University of South Carolina Press. If you go to their website, if you Google them and you Google uh, Simbeck, that'll come right up. And just for our exclusive listeners and viewers, if you type in uh, the code J-L-E-X-L-I-B, you'll get a 20% discount on that book. So I encourage you to check that out. Yeah, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and Rob, and I'm going to turn my camera off so you don't have to don't have to look at me. You can look at them instead. But yeah, if you got questions, send them in, and I'll pass it on to them. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. I'm glad to share the screen here tonight with uh, you two gentlemen. And talking about wildlife is uh, something I'm very interested in. I've written about it a lot, and I've really been enjoying looking at Rob's book. It's a beautiful little book. It's just it's in the hand so nice and it's full of information uh, in sort of an essay style as we were talking earlier about a lot of species 36 some of which you'll be familiar with some maybe you don't see too often like a great white shark my sisters and family and I were at the beach this summer when a five-foot shark swam among them and that was a fast exit out of the water but uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about wildlife and it seems to me I may be wrong but it seems to me that a lot of people uh, have sort of lost touch with wildlife uh, compared to the days when I was growing up in rural Georgia and certainly when I was working at South Carolina Wildlife because that was our bread and butter. But it's real great to have Rob here tonight to talk about his book, how it came about. And he has an interesting connection with country music artists. He's in Nashville, so he's a versatile guy. And um, Rob, I'm glad to have you here, bud. Thank you, Tom, very much. I'm, I'm really um, glad to have you uh, to talk to you about this. You're the perfect guy for it. Well, we've we got the same interest just about. I want to talk start out uh, talking about the red velvet ant. We talked about that earlier today. People see these large velvet looking sort of orangish red striped ants. I'd say they're what, about a quarter of an inch long, a little bit bigger maybe? A little bigger, yeah. And it's not an ant at all. You can tell people what it is and what it'll do if you like. It's actually a wasp, and it's one of those things where we don't always name uh, things quite what they are. We, we go by sight sometimes, especially for, um, uh, for common names, not the scientific names, which is why they exist. But the red velvet ant is also called a cow killer, and it will deliver a sting, and I have been fortunate enough not to have experienced it, but the experts that I know, people who deal with poisonous and biting and stinging insects will tell you there is no comparison that the red velvet ant is something you do not want to get stung by. Um, but it's one of those things that in the Southeast, 
it's not that uncommon. In fact, I think you said you saw one not that long ago. Sure did, in my yard. My mother used to talk about them. If you would take a little stick and, and irritate them, uh, aggravate them, they'll make some squeaks. But it is a wasp. It's a wingless wasp, and you don't want to mess with it. But it's a beautiful creature. Beautiful. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. And, yeah. um, and it's one of... Uh, you were talking in, in introducing this that people don't have the connection. You and I, I'm betting, both grew up spending as much time as we could in woods and fields and it was an era in which as long as you were home by the time it was really dark nobody worried much about you we had we were on the edge of a town and i grew up in pennsylvania uh, in part, the northern most part of the appalachians um we were on the outside of a town and passed across the the street the houses that were there there was a creek and then woods and then, you know, way out, there were some more houses in the airport, but it was a place to get lost day in and day out. It was, you, you learned how to, to, to build a slingshot. You learned how to make a tree house. You learned uh, what the butterflies and birds were. You found a swimming hole. You, you know, the pollywogs and frogs and um, all the things that you see as a kid were simply part of growing up and i think we miss that and even if there's a kid now who's got his or her, her nose in a handheld device or a computer and is reading about animals it's 10 times better to get out there and watch them and interact and the thing is as a parent it is not difficult to get a child interested in a bird or a butterfly and just to talk about what you know about them or what you don't know about them and then go in and get the book and get the computer. That's, you know, what I want. One of the things this book I hope does is gives parents a tool for saying, hey, we saw a robin in the yard. There's a robin in this book. Let's read about it. That's right. In my day, we would take June bugs and tie a sewing thread to them, and let them fly in a circle around our head. That was our equivalent to today's drones, I guess. Now kids go out and have drones. We played with June bugs. But, you know, lightning bug time is something special we write about down south. You know, it's that time when the gloaming, so to speak, is in effect. And those bugs, the lightning bugs start coming out. So I want to ask you, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you have an interesting selection of species, and they're divided into three categories, air, land, and water, which makes perfect sense. Um, Tell, tell me how you came to, to select the species you did. Okay, so for 25 years, I wrote the column called Four Wildlife Watchers for South Carolina Wildlife Magazine. It was as close to my core identity as a writer as anything I've done. And I've written a lot of books through the years. I've done music things, as you mentioned. I've done business work, ghosted for people. But this is where I got simply to download that part of my brain that thinks that the animals around us are magical and then to lead from there into a conversation with an expert who can say here's how they nest here's where they live here's the challenges they face and that sort of thing to try to bring the best of, of those worlds together and so over the course of 25 years i had well over 150 columns and so when the university of south carolina press was kind enough to catch the vision and say, let's work up a book um, to, to encapsulate this thing and try to capture what we can of it. I looked through and there were some that I knew I had to include. This book starts with the American Crow. And that's because for 20 years, Debbie and I, my better half, we raised chickens. And when, if you've got chickens and pay attention, they will tell you what's going on. They will tell you when they lay eggs. They'll tell you when there's a hawk in the area. They'll tell you when the neighbor's cat's out. You just have to learn to listen. And once I did that, I listened to all the other birds. And the crows and the blue jays were the ones who had the most announcements and had the most going on. They were the most interesting of the birds. I've seen more owls in my life because a crow or blue jay told me there was one in the neighborhood than probably any other means through my life. That had to be there. I did a piece on um, the ruby-throated hummingbird because Debbie, when we first started dating back in the 80s, was a hummingbird fanatic, and I learned so much about them from her. And there's, you know, part of the romance of our relationship was tied up in hummingbirds. So there were things like that. And once I got 
quite a few of them picked out. It just made sense to be as balanced as possible. And although it's a, it's a really primal way to divide it, air, land, and water, I hadn't seen it done before that plainly, you know, that um, primally. And it just seemed to make sense and give me a structure that worked. It makes a great structure, you know. One of the, one of the water species is the great white shark. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, the great white shark, I mean, for those of us who are old enough to remember um, the movie Jaws when it first came out, that changed uh, the perception of wildlife in a way that, in a way that in its own way was as big as Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Mm -hmm. It changed, that changed the way we thought about bald eagles and DDT. And this changed the way we thought about sharks. And the trick is, I list in here, there are a dozen animals, including cows, which kill more people every year than great white sharks. We simply don't need to worry about them unless you're on a beach at which there's been an announcement that they're in the neighborhood. Um, they are fierce predators. They are ancient animals which have not had to change a lot to, to remain a really viable species. And again, they're fierce predators. They're worth respecting. Um, but it's something that there's as much myth as anything. And fortunately, uh, we have people studying them and getting out the good information about them because they're, they're endangered. They're one of too many species in our oceans that we have over harvested. You cannot, uh, one of the things this book I hope gets across too is that, I don't know if the word responsibility uh, is the word, but we are connected to every living thing out there and we have an effect on every living thing out there. And when you're making uh, soup out of shark fins and feeding a billion people or more, you can have an impact on them. And so I really welcome the fact that there are scientists studying them and getting out good information so that we don't fear uh, them the way we do on another land-based creature that you're gonna wanna bring up that we over fear. Okay, all right. Peter Benchley regretted that book, and that movie, uh, because it unleashed a, a, a shark killing frenzy, you know. Well, I think he spent some of his time later in life trying to undo the harm that movie had done. As for me personally, I wouldn't get in the water over my knees for a while after seeing that movie. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned expert or scientists doing all this work. Now you had about what uh, forty six experts, forty experts, forty six or fifty experts who I brought in. And again, this was a column for South Carolina Wildlife. So at first, every piece that I did. I ran by an expert, I got quotes, I had conversations with him or her. You know, how can I best present them? Here is my story. Here's what really has grabbed me about this creature. And it goes from the earthworm, again, to the to the bald eagle and the bobcat. So it's, it's a wide variety. But I wanted someone who could bring good science and tell me the latest about how their populations are doing. Are they endangered? Um, is our expanding of cities and suburbs into their territory hurting them and how can we best watch and respect them and once the book became the southern wildlife watcher so we wanted to expand our geography and bring in people from arkansas to florida and from virginia to texas um, i expanded the range of the people who i talked to but everything's been updated so the latest information at press time is what we're using here and uh, you know it, as an essayist, I want to be poetic. I want to draw people in with the wonder of all this, but I want to tie it to sound science and people who really know the basics. There are a lot of myths concerning some species of wildlife. For example, I've often heard that an alligator can outrun a quarter horse for 40 yards. And I asked Phil Wilkinson, who used to be at DNR, who's a world, worldwide expert on alligators, and he said that was not true, that they can't do that. So, you know, there's a lot of fear, and I want to talk about my buddies, the copperheads right now, the copperhead snakes, which is a beautiful animal. Um, they don't stand a chance when they come through most people's yards, and I know no one likes to think of a venomous snake living around their their habitat, their human habitat, but yeah. there's this irrational fear of snakes most people have, and they just kill them and identify them later. 
you want to you want to talk about the, your Copperhead piece that you wrote? Yeah, and and that goes back to the fact that as we expand where we live, Copperheads don't move into our areas; we move into theirs. And it's the same with most of the wild creatures out there. South Carolina once at one time had wolves and buffalo and mountain lions and all kinds of things that aren't here anymore because we pushed them out. And so we've got to first own that little bit of humility that they've not moved toward us, we've moved toward them. Um, with snakes, there's you know, been a primal um, fear of them going back to a biblical and other literature of the ancients. And I've got neighbors like you do who will not tolerate the presence of a snake. And for my money, as someone who loves and respects the wildlife around us, it's wasteful, it's self-defeating. That's a good way to invite, you know, rats and mice and other things that we don't want that these animals take care of. Yes, you want to shoo them away. Yes, you want to mow the grass for away, away so that they don't have easy places to hide. But most of the snakes that we see are going to be non-venomous. And when it comes to copperheads, they are probably the most uh, populous of the um, venomous snakes. And as I say in the, in the piece, and I've had friends bitten by them. I had one friend who as you said before, name me somebody you know who's been killed by a snake bite. It's really, really rare. They can put the hurt on you, but for um, uh, Whit Gibbons, our mutual friend at University of Georgia, talks about the fact you're going to get bitten by a, a poisonous snake. Uh, you probably want it to be a copperhead. They don't want to waste their venom, so they're not going to use it all on you. They don't want to bite you. They want to run away. They want to avoid you, if at all possible. And they're not big. They're not nearly as big as, for instance, the rat snake uh, you see in your yard. So there are those advantages. Their job is to hide and to kill the mice and other critters that we would just soon not have around our grain and our gardens and things. That's right. They're beautiful. Yeah. Rob, I, I got a question for you from one of the viewers. Lily wanted to know uh, which animal in the book was the most fun for you to write about? It would be the hummingbird, um, simply because, as I said, that was where Debbie and I connected. And if, if you don't mind, let me read just the opening of that piece, just to give you a flavor of uh, what the book is about how I approach things and why this might well be my favorite piece. All right, this is the Ruby Throated Humming, the opening of the Ruby Throated Hummingbird chapter. Sit here on the porch, Debbie said one Sunday afternoon in early summer. I want to show you my hummingbirds. We had just started dating and I had come to visit her at her little white house in the country. She picked up something that looked like an hourglass with several tiny red saxophones sticking out the bottom. I soon learned it was a hummingbird feeder, but my knowledge of flora, fauna, and their associated hardware was so rudimentary at the time that I had no idea. She walked a few paces into the yard and stood holding the gadget about a foot in front of her face, which wore a look of determined expectation. She stood this way for several minutes, her arm crooked at a 45 degree angle, until I began to believe the hummingbirds might be imaginary and that I should think about tiptoeing toward my car. Soon, though, something that sounded like a tiny atomic cat purring zipped across my field of vision. It stopped a few feet from her in the feeder, hanging in midair like a battery-operated Christmas ornament, its body angled kind of like the Concorde. It eyed her, eyed the feeder, and moved in for a drink. Debbie lit up like she'd just been named Miss America, and I have to admit I was pretty impressed, too. The thing had a black throat, or at least it looked black until the sun caught it just right when it glowed like bright red coals. Its back was nearly was a nearly as pretty iridescent green. It was feeding inches from Debbie's face. Soon it was joined by another, this one with a white throat, which moved in for its own drink. They buzzed back and forth, drinking for a bit, zipping off to the edge of the woods, then coming back for about 10 minutes until Debbie's arm finally gave out. She came back to me and smiled. Pretty good, huh? She said, it was. <laughs> It really was. Yeah, that's great. It's great. I love them too. I have feeders out and I find myself leaving my work periodically to go watch them to feed and see how they're doing and all. Um, 
I want to talk to while well, I just look at one of my questions here because you have a really unique background. You've written country music songs, isn't that correct? I have. All right. Exactly. So wildlife species and country music sort of have a connection, don't they? That goes all the way back. I mean, if you know country's history, uh, Hank Williams Sr. fished on Kentucky Lake, which is about an hour, hour and a half from here, um, all the time. Um, Hank Jr. is, of course, a, a hunter and fisherman. And it's hard to find a country singer who didn't grow up with a respect for the outdoors. There are certain things that end up in country songs and that's one of them. And I, I moved to town as a songwriter in 1982 from Los Angeles. I'd been a magazine editor out there and I had a band and I was writing songs, getting published in Nashville, and I could never make a living as a songwriter. I'd get cuts here and there, things you know I really liked. But um, uh, then I started writing bios and outdoor pieces when I met Debbie. And so I had two parallel careers. And then I spent the same 25 years that I had with South Carolina Wildlife I spent with a guy named Bob Kingsley, who counted down the top 40 on 300 and some stations for for years. And those things ran parallel, and it's not hard to interest a country singer in a conversation about the out of doors. And so both of them have been very good to me uh, through the years. And, it's, and we ended up, when we looked for possible endorsement quotes, uh, we were fortunate enough to get them from uh, Leon Womack, Kex Brooks from Brooks and Dunn, and the, the late Charlie Daniels um, said nice things about it. In fact, he he wrote a little thing that talked about how it was a great look at outdoor species by a son of the South. And I called and said, Charlie, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Can you make me an adopted son of the South? And he said, sure. And so we changed the quote. Yeah. Well, that's great. I tell you, um, I'm going to talk to you more about writing country music. I'm, I've got an interest in that, as I explained to you earlier today. Uh, we talked about the experts earlier. How did you assemble them? How did you find all these guys? So with South Carolina, I would start with the SCDNR. I'd start with Clemson. I would Google the animal that I was writing about and South Carolina. Too. Well, in the early days, I didn't because I wasn't Google back in the 90s. So it was word of mouth. I'd ask friends of mine or I'd call it SCDNR and say, who is your expert on da da da? But now for this book, when I expanded it and replaced probably three quarters of my South Carolina people with experts from other states, the internet uh, for all its faults is as good a tool as you will ever have for finding information quickly. And to Google um, crawfish, Louisiana, is going to bring you stories and you look at a handful of them until you think boy i like that guy's voice or you know that woman really knows what she's talking about i would love to talk to her and i assembled them that way i just drop them an email and say hey i'm putting together a book on ta -da, da da um i i need you so that i don't look stupid after the ink runs i don't mind looking stupid beforehand and i will but after the ink runs i want an expert involved would you be willing to work with me and almost invariably and i i dedicate the book to linda renshaw and the people who work in the outdoors the people who work for state wildlife and natural resource agencies are the most knowledgeable and humble and hardworking and underappreciated people i have ever run across that's a fact and going back to being correct, if you make a mistake in writing and it gets published, you will hear from people. I worked for a daily newspaper fresh out of college. I spent four years there and I, you had to write about everything. And this was back in the 70s. Uh, you had a typewriter and a telephone and they would say the oil uh, embargo in the Middle East is affecting the Pennsylvania oil fields. Find out how you have three hours go. And you picked up that phone and started calling around. And if you messed up, everybody in town would let you know that you had. And it was grad school. It was a way to learn. You can find anybody if you're really serious about it. And you can separate what you know from what you don't know in a way that you can actually publish and feel confident about. Um, but it will, it will teach you the basics. It will teach you to how to learn and um, how to research. Well, your book's taught me something already. I was reading about the trending down of uh, blue, blue jay populations. 
uh, because of what West Nile virus. Yeah. And, and I've always liked that bird. My mother said it was a mean bird. It is aggressive. I know that, but it's a beautiful bird. Yeah, and it will, and as I say in there, it almost comes into the feeder screaming and kicking little birds aside. It just kicks them out of the way and will take over a feeder. And it, it, to me, it, it is kind of the bad guy in an old Western. I mean, the robin is the school marm and the mockingbird is the sheriff and the blue jay is just the bad guy. And you can learn to find them to be interesting uh, and attractive, um, even though they will outcompete some of the other birds. Some people don't like them, but I, I like and respect almost everything that shows up in the feeder. And if, you know, if there are birds that, because there are invasive species that we talk about here too, and species that weren't here, but the housefly is not native to North America. Neither are the most common kinds of earthworms that we find. They are both, the earthworms are brought in in ballast from ships coming across the Atlantic. The fly came with us from Asia, uh, all over the world. And to know that the bluebird being outcompeted by a native species is different than the bluebird being outcompeted by a starling, which is not a native species. Correct. Correct. I'm going to chime in here a minute. One of, the, one of our viewers, Shirley, she said her blue jay loves to fight her cats for their cat food. And then she has some pretty healthy, healthy blue jays. And I had another question from another viewer, Richard wanted to know um, where are the best places to bird in the Midlands and Tom that may be more up your alley I don't I don't know Rob how familiar you are with the Midlands and the Carolinas I, I know personally I'm a bit of a birder myself I don't know if a lot of people know that but the Congaree National Swamp is a good place to go but you guys may have some other ideas I yeah, think Congaree's a great place yeah and, yeah. and, and Bob, you would know that better than I would, but that's one thing about the book. One thing I do make sure that I talk about is the, the places, at least in general information. With South Carolina, I could do specifically, and every piece I used to say, go here, go there, and I relied on my experts for that. And around the Southeast, I will talk in more general terms, but Tom, you may have a, a better handle on the best birding spots in the, in the mid-state. I'm not that much of a birder outside of my own backyard feeders, but the Congaree National Park, I would think maybe uh, Harbison State Forest, any area uh, you can get out, like the Carolina Bays, if you want to go to one are great places for bird life, but that's a bit of a, a distance. Uh, issue for some people and they're very wild places and some people are really kind of nervous about going to them. Uh, one of the birds that really interests me that and we talked about this earlier is the American crow because of its intelligence and like you say if there's an owl or hawk around you'll know it. I heard um, a ruckus the other week there's about 12 crows stationing themselves in limbs and being very quiet like they were going to ambush something. I watched them do this then they all took off. But I read a piece about the guy in Philadelphia, up in Pennsylvania, who trained uh, the crows in his area to pick up shiny objects and drop them into a device on his rooftop that would trigger a feeder response and put out pellets of food. And he was getting change, jewelry, all kinds of things these crows were bringing to him. And I thought, man, that's, that's a fascinating story right there, the intelligence of crows. Crows and ravens are ridiculously smart creatures. Crows have been seen to pull up fishing lines to eat what's on the end of them on the hook, especially with ice fishing and stuff. They, there are studies that I quote in here that show if you send um, people in uh, to go after crows into a field, they can count. Small, you send three in and two back out to try to fool them. They, they're too smart for that. You have to send in five or six people and then send four or five back out before you can fool them. But yeah, they will collect, like some bird species will, but especially they will collect shiny objects to bring back. And as part of that nesting um, response or the, the reproductive, the, the mating response where uh, the male wants to impress the female. Um, the, the males of any species, as, as I say in one of these pieces, are generally at a disadvantage and we will, depending on what species we are, we will go to any length to prove that we are worth hanging on to if you're a female. And that brings up one of the things about dimorphism, where in many species, the female is the much drabber of the two. And that's because if you're gonna be on a nest as a female, you do not want to 
uh, advertise your presence there. You kind of want to blend in. And the male, again, is going to use every trick, including over the course of evolutionary history, being as brightly uh, feathered as possible to attract that attention he's looking for. That's right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell any ladies they're the drab part of the species these days, I don't think. And that would be wise. Uh, I want to I want to move it to a sea creature that I'm sort of fond of. I had the opportunity once to film a nesting loggerhead sea turtle at Cape Romaine Wildlife Refuge. And it was fascinating to watch the whole process, the digging of the nest, the depositing of the eggs, and then even a, a fake nest to throw off raccoons and other predators. And then many years later, I was able to witness the, the emergence of hatchlings coming up out of the sand and making their way to the sea. Tell us a little bit about the loggerhead sea turtle aspect of your book. One of the great things um, about the, the movement that began with um, just people like Roger Torrey Peterson doing the field guides and the, the naturalists who made us more aware of our relationship to creatures and our effect on them, there have been, there's been a lot of effort to protect sea turtles. We know more about the fact that lights can distract them and throw them off course. And there are people who have looked to protect beaches all around the Atlantic, the Gulf and the Caribbean. Anthropomorphically, the, the turtles are so attractive to us because there's those, those little babies crawling up out of the sand and scrambling to the sea, which does not offer safety. It makes them into paddling hors d'oeuvres and we root for them. And then the mother, 30 years later, comes lumbering back after 10 or 15 years in the Mediterranean or off the coast of Africa. When the food uh, gets scarce there, they come back and then we see them lumber up onto the beach and the the salt coming out of salt glands in their eyes look like tears, like they're giving everything they've got into laying those eggs. And it's something that we can appreciate and they're big enough that we, we recognize, you know, if we can do something to help us do this. So in the last few years, that kind of effort and efforts to keep off lights on beaches have really helped their populations. And it's a really heartening develop, as heartening as it has been with a bald ego where we recognized we got to stop using DDT because it thins the eggs to where they break them. And so it's a success story. And I'm glad that's something that you've gotten to to witness up close like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a fabulous thing to see up, up in person. It sure is. Um, I was going to talk to you also about one of my favorite species because I love its its call. That's the whippoorwill. I know it's not in the book, but have you written about whippoorwills? I have. And the, the trick is that we live about 15 miles outside of Nashville. When we moved here, you heard whippermills, whippoorwills on summer nights. It is a sound, I mean, it drives some people crazy because they do go on, but it is a magical sound. And, you know, Hank Sr. Um, put it together with train whistles and it's an iconic country image. We also had quail in the backyard and you would see a mama and 16, you know, youngins uh, scramble across the yard. And we don't have them anymore. We haven't had them in 20 or 25 years. We've still got foxes and a lot of other things that were part of the magic when we first moved in. But ground nesting birds face things like coyotes, they, feral dogs and cats, people, please keep your dogs and your cats at hand. Tell yourself, if it helps, that you don't want to meet and buy coyotes. But the trick is they disrupt habitat. They kill birds. Ground nesters don't stand a chance against them. And it's just part of something that we can do to help assure that a magical sound, like a whippoorwill calling at night, um, can go on. The quail down south here now have to contend with fire ants that destroy their eggs. You know, and the, and the, well, the young hatchlings, they'll get on them and kill them, you know. So now I want to ask you something. We talked about how long this this took. Um, people don't always realize there's a, a process you go through when you do a book. It gets scrutinized a lot. You know, there's peer reviews by experts that you don't know who they are. And uh, you're asked sometimes to change things. But it, overall, it's a really interesting process, but it takes a lot of time. And uh, I get questions all the time from people about 
wanting to write a book. Do you get that same question? People want to write a book and they ask you how to do it, how to go about it? Absolutely. And and people who say, you know, my life deserves a movie, write a book about me. And I always tell them the same thing. <laughs> I want you to get a little handheld tape deck and speak into it for a total of 10 hours of all the interesting things that have gone on in your life. Only one person has ever done it and I ended up writing about that person. But it will, where the rubber meets the road is the fact that I think people picture uh, a Garrett and the romance of writing it for a couple of weeks and then going to a signing which has thousands of people at it. And that ain't the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, writing for a living is spending every day at a desk or in my case i just i lean the bed up i have one of those beds that that you know turns into a, a, a place where i can sit and i've got a window at the side with bird feeders and i write if you can do something else and get distracted easily you will not be a writer and you can't compete with me because i get up every morning and i write and then the signings well, first of all, you got to find the book deal, which means once you think your baby is pretty, you've got to convince an editor that your baby is pretty. And in most cases, even if you've written the book, what you have to give that editor is not the book, but a 45 page. Um, somebody coming in? We're okay. But, but a 45 page um, book proposal, which has got parameters laid down through the ages. And the most important thing is not how good the book is. It's whether or not you know who the audience is and whether you can reach them and convince them to, to purchase the book. So it's it's a whole other world than what most people think. Just the way my musician friends will tell you, it's not that hour that you're up there. Haggard said, you don't pay me for that hour I'm on the stage. I'll do that for nothing. You pay me for the 23 hours that I'm on a bus and waiting backstage with you know bad food and having to do this, that, and the other. That's right. It's, it's a labor of love in some ways. It's not easy. A lot of people have misconceptions about it. Um, I want to ask you, too, you may have covered this, your favorite species in the book. Other than hummingbird? Well, the favorite one to write about was the hummingbird, but I'm a pileated woodpecker guy. But my favorite yeah. bird, I mean, give me something that yo-ho-hos and rips big chunks of barks off, and you can hear for half a mile away, give me that, you know, sort of one-eyed pirate of the woods, which I consider them. Plus, they're smart enough to stay away from us. And so seeing them is always a treat. But it's, uh, I wish that we still had the ivory build, which was half again as big. But I'm, you know, my species, if I'm a birder, I think the prettiest bird for me is the red-headed woodpecker. That's a beautiful. Um, just a gorgeous bird. And I'm what I say in, in the piece about the pileated that yes, warblers are wonderful and can be gorgeous, but mostly they're in the tops of trees eating worms. They sit still for half a second. By the time you get them with your binoculars, you don't know what the field marks are. You're grabbing for your book trying to figure it out. So give me a woodpecker. Okay. You mentioned something, binoculars, closely related to that, are cameras. I see a lot of people taking pictures of, of wildlife birds and so forth and putting it on Facebook. And, you, and most of the time, they're pretty bad photos. How can people become a better photographer of wildlife? Have you got some tips for them? Yeah, you want a camera which has got uh, a zoom lens uh, at the very least. I mean, you don't need to, to buy the whole telephoto lens. I have got a Canon um, that has got, and it's just a little, it's, you know, a little bigger than a deck of cards. It's the point and shoot kind that it will do the calculating for you. And it's, uh, it's uh, optical zoom is 30 times. And that's pretty good because you don't have to be right on top of a bird to get a good photo. And the trick is always to get detail. You don't want the bird to be one thirtieth of your picture. You want it to be half or more of your frame. You want to get right in there on it. And the only way to do that is with a good zoom lens. And you practice on your porch or your deck or in a lawn chair by looking at one of your feeders, which you will be cleaning regularly because birds spread diseases among themselves. And you know, every so often you want to wash it with bleach and get it back out there and replace it. But you sit there with your camera and you practice zooming in on a bird that's gonna spend a minute there and look for interesting photos and go on 
Facebook pages dedicated to bird photography, and there are a lot of them, and you'll see the ones that just knock your eyes out and make you think, now that's photography, and you just drop a line and say, hey, you know, what did you do, what kind of camera? But start with a camera that has got a good zoom lens and practice in your yard, because it's not easy. Most birds don't sit still very long, and as gorgeous as they are, the light's gotta be right. The one disadvantage, of the kind of camera that I use is if the light is not good, if they're heavily in shadow and stuff, it's tough to get a good photo. You need good sunlight. But oh, yeah. it's worth it to me. It's worth it to That's me bad. to uh, to be out on a good day and, and take pictures. Because I post them a lot on my Facebook page and people love that stuff. I don't I don't talk anything controversial. I post pictures of critters and try to be a bright spot on Facebook. Uh, well, Rob, yeah. Speaking about photographs, I've got, I, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but I've got a picture of, looks like a groundhog or a whistle pig. There's a couple names of it. And I think that's as, as a picture from your book, actually, um, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. If, if, do you want to say any words about that, that animal right there? Well, first of all, let me say that Philip Jones took most of the pictures. There were several photographers involved, but they were just gorgeous pictures. One of the good things about working for a state wildlife magazine is that they really put the care into the art, into making it look, you know, glossy paper, great uh, four color reproduction. And the thing that impresses me about groundhogs is we look at them as, you know, uh, cuddly, kind of awkward, ambling around the edge of the yard, maybe. They are fierce. They will get in your face if you are a predator. And from coyotes to bobcats to everything else, they know to respect them because any animal whose claws and teeth will allow it to dig eight feet straight down and then 40 feet of tunnels on both sides with dens and stuff, if you can move that much dirt with what God gave you, you have got formidable weapons on your hands. And we love them. We make sure that the garden is fenced to where they're not gonna, you know, do more damage than um, we can tolerate and we love having them around and woodchuck is the name that the scientists use for them and since i grew up in pennsylvania and was a newspaper editor there we sent people down to punxsutawney every february 2nd which just happens to be halfway between the first day of winter and the first day of spring which is why it was chosen as groundhog day this little fellow looks a little bit like bill murray's nemesis in caddyshack he sure does a lot of people won't remember that movie. We had a lot of fun with it. I'm looking at your monarch photo too. That that's that's a great story there. I know that's close to your heart. You might want to read a little bit of that for us. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, this is from the monarch chapter, which of course is in the air critters, and um, it opens like this: To become a dedicated wildlife watcher is to lose yourself to wonder. It is to marvel at the bud and the blossom, the goldfinch's molt and the spider's web. It is to treasure the cicada's buzz, the frog's croak, and the groundhog's waddle. To relish the dolphin's breach, the bumblebee's flight, and the blue jay's wheedling call. Even amid all that, there are phenomena that stand out, that become ever more dumbfounding the closer we look and the more we ponder. Take the monarch butterfly, in its journey, its annual resurgence, its sheer unbidden beauty, we find an encapsulization of all that is transporting about the natural world. Four inches from wingtip to wingtip, a monarch weighs half as much as a dollar bill and has a brain the size of a peppercorn. And yet every fall, millions of them, just a few weeks old, begin an epic migration. From Canada and much of the United States east of the Rockies, they head south over terrain they have never seen toward a dozen specks of forest, most part of the monarch butterfly biosphere reserve in the mountains of southern Mexico, a gathering place not known to scientists until 1975. There, in fir trees nearly two miles above sea level, they congregate to ride out the winter in a display that led the entomologist Lincoln Brower, known for his research into and work toward protection of the monarch, to write, I couldn't believe the density and numbers. It was like walking into Chart Cathedral and seeing light coming through stained glass windows. This was the eighth wonder of the world. That's great, that's great. I was writing about monarchs the other day and um, 
I know if you look for the milkweed that they like, you can sort of set up a camera sometimes and capture a good photo of them that way, you know. Part part of photographing wildlife is looking ahead and planning. Yeah. And, you know, I, I tend to be sort of an opportunistic guy that just sees something and shoots it. But I've worked with some guys like Philip and Robert Clark, Larry Cameron, great photographers here in South Carolina, who actually plan and uh, in a methodical way what they're going to do. So they're very prepared for it, you know. And it's was, great to take a course. There are lots of state parks and things that will have a really good nature photographer lead you on a field trip and show you this is what you look for. This is the kind of plant you want the water source, this, that or the other, and learn a little bit about that sort of thing, which you can also pick up by yourself in a woods walk. But why not uh, telescope the process and go with somebody who knows what they're doing? That's right. That's right. I, I've been fortunate to be able to accompany Robert Clark for many years now into Carolina Bays and other places and just sort of pick up some of what he does. You know, I know that he uh, researches the tides, the weather, of course, the season changes and so forth. And he's really a scientist in some ways and an artist at the same time with a camera. Well, I think your book is a great addition to anybody's home. And I would really encourage parents, like you said, to get their kids away from their iPads and handheld devices go out into the wild world out there and see what nature really is all about because we can learn a lot from it, you know. And as you said earlier, as some of these species go, like amphibians, like this frog we see here, yeah. so goes man. They're the first indicator sometimes of things that are going wrong. They are the canary in the coal mine and we've got to know, understand that. And um, they're interesting creatures. It's hard, it's not hard to interest a kid in a bullfrog. If they can catch them. We used to go gigging when I was a kid, and uh, of course we had rabbit boxes and things that kids today don't have any idea about what how we used to live, you know, before all these gadgets came along. And uh, I find it kind of sad in a way. I made some slingshots with my two grandsons up in North Carolina when they were young boys, and they were fascinated with them. They didn't know such a thing could be made, you know. But it's all it's all fun out there in the outdoors. Are you going to have a sequel to this book? Is it going to be a follow up? I'm, I'm betting that if it sells, I can talk to USC Press into it. Okay. So, I, got, I got another question for you. How did the red fox, which is beautiful, I love that animal, so beautiful, how did it make the cover? Um, there, the art person at uh, USC Press chose this and I thought did a, a spectacular job. I love the, <laughs> the line across the middle and we've got land and air here and it's it's just a, a a gorgeous shot and debbie my better half who is a country girl um said you know that's a pretty scrawny fox so she was she's used to the the big well-fed ones we sometimes see around here but i think it's a gorgeous animal and it's hard to beat the the hummingbird as a uh, you know hanging in midair like that uh, it's gorgeous i'm really pleased with the design and with photos well the press did a great job you got a beautiful cover there uh, i had another question too because i've had problems with these when my mother was alive i'd have to go down home to georgia and get the carpenter bees out of her red cedar patio furniture a lot of people see carpenter bees they think bumblebee right. Can I tell us a little bit about the carpenter bee well the, the trick in noticing the difference and you just have to look close enough to know whether the uh, abdomen is hairy or not the black aft part uh, on a uh, carpenter bee is shiny smooth, not a hair on it. Bumblebees, um, and it's where they are. If it's near the ground and going flower to flower since the bumblebee's ground nesting, you're probably gonna uh, have that. And if it's looking at your wood, um, it's probably a carpenter bee, but that's the way to tell them is that abdomen. And uh, again, um, our friend from uh, Georgia um, talked about the fact that he loves them. He said they don't, you know, he's had them for years and they're interesting to watch. They're attracted to yellow. You can get them to come over to you if you put on a, you know, bright yellow shirt. And he said, they're not gonna make your deck collapse. So just enjoy the show. And there are other people who say, look, I will do what I have to not to have them around. And in most cases, paint and varnish the wood. They like raw wood better. And you can look up ways to discourage them, but they're great pollinators. You know, again, learn the fact that if we do away with them, we lose one of our 
better pollinators for, for many species. That's right. And I've seen digger bees also, which are very unusual. They make little clay-like adobe huts individually. Have you ever seen those? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, get outside, people. Go out. Turn your TVs off. I haven't turned my TV on since uh, the college football championship was played. I don't watch TV. Uh, yeah, I know. I like to light and take pictures, and that's my outlet for me, you know. And I encourage people to get outdoors and learn a little bit more about it the copperhead and the, the, the copper and the bees. You go to the coast, you know, talk to people about loggerhead sea turtles. You know, understand how the natural world works together as one big machine, so to speak. We're all parts of it and have an integral role in keeping things going. It, it's really a lot of fun to do that kind of thing. We sure I hope you do another book. We're all brethren. Yeah. yeah. Those are some good words. Uh, Rob, are there any closing words that you got for us? Uh, we got about five minutes left before we we shut it down but um do you got anything that you want to wrap up with the the life th this is the part of my life where i get to play author mostly i just work at being a writer this is where i get to play author i get to have an interesting conversation w with somebody whose work i respect uh and who shares just that you know that childlike excitement at seeing the critters out there and we've both managed to turn it into a living to share with other people what we see this book uh this is my 22nd book as either writer ghost writer or editor and it's the one that's closest to my heart it's where i'm able to take just the things that uh, intrigue and excite me day to day and turn them into prose and i love the process of getting the word out and there's always an ulterior motive and in this case it is that I want all of us to, um, as Tom and I talked about, to respect the connection we have uh, with the world. There is only one that we've got. This is where we live. And for us to treat it as well as possible while meeting our needs is as important a call as we have. And I hope people will look at this book as just a way for two friends for, for us to become new friends and sort of sit chatting in front of the fireplace in the winter or on the screened in porch on a summer evening and talk about the critters around us. And um, it, it's been a, a wonderful process. Turning this uh, longtime column of mine into a book has been a labor of love. I'm so thrilled with the press, with the uh, love that they've poured into the book and with the work that they're putting into to getting the word out. I mean, this is, um, and, and let me say something about the Lexington County Public Library. My affection for libraries goes back to my youngest days as a kid. A library card was one of the first tickets you had to a bigger world as a kid in my little town. And uh, people, uh, librarians spread the word. They know what comes out. They know what books are out there. They. Uh, you know, they um, they see the trends. And they that is another group of people like those who work for state wildlife agencies who are, I think, underappreciated day in and day out and are so important. There's an ecosystem with books. You know, we're losing physical books. Uh, and the book industry has lost control of its price point and a lot of other things by the way they're put out now and by the way that online companies um, uh, price things and deal with it. And so just to know that your library has books and services that can make your life better um, is, is an important uh, point for all of us. We love bookstores, we love libraries. I couldn't That's agree good. with you more. I, I'm looking a little green on my camera, but I'm starting to blush over here with all the good <laughs> words that you're saying, and I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, Tom, if you got a couple words, I'm gonna close it out too, if there's anything you wanna mention. Well, I'd like to remind people they can get Rob's books at the book bookstores. You can have them ordered for you. You can get it from USC Press online. And I'm going to have to figure out a way to get him to sign mine somehow. We'll figure that out. I might have to go up to Nashville one day. We'll make it work. Yeah, but I enjoy being here with all, both of you tonight. And I really respect and appreciate all that the Lexington County Library does for me. Each summer, they usually get my services, so to speak, as a summer author. And I'll go around and speak to several branches. This year, it didn't work out for some reason. A strange twilight zone year we're in. Yeah, 
but uh, I love libraries too. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Thank, thanks to both of you. Um, I want to thank both you guys for coming. I want to thank both you guys for, for talking with us. Um, yeah, the Southern Wildlife Watcher is available through the University of South Carolina Press website as well. Again, there's a special code that you can type in to get 20% discount. The code is J-L-E-X-L-I-B. I'm also going to be sending out an email to everybody who's joined us, and uh, it'll be followed up with the email is going to include uh, um, information about getting that discount as well. And, and with that, I want to thank everybody for attending. We actually had a pretty fair number of attendees, and I really appreciate you guys coming. And thanks for spending the yeah. evening with us. And thanks, Tom, for coming. Thanks, Rob, for coming. And, and hopefully we can do this again soon. And I am going to end the meeting. But I appreciate you guys. And, and stay in touch. It's a thank you, Tom. Thank everybody who attended. Okay, guys. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.